All right, Matthew chapter 17. We're actually going to start reading a little bit earlier in Matthew chapter 16. Last week I said that I was going to cover uh, the la basically the last verse in Matthew chapter 16 this week because it all ties together here. And um, actually I want to start reading in verse number 24. The Bible says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death, till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Now, before I get into verse 28 there, I actually want to say, you know, when I preach through the end of this, because there's a lot of other things I was focused on last week, I kind of made a couple statements here that are not false, but was probably not as accurately um, in context with the passage. Specifically when I said, uh, or when we read the verse, what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I kind of made reference to the, you know, the, the value of salvation and like how could, you know, how much is it worth, right? Of course, it's, it's, it's worth everything. What are you going to give in exchange for your soul? However, in the context here, I think it's more appropriately, and, and someone came up to me after the service and, and brought this up. And I've already thought about this before and I've had discussion about this before and I agree with what this other person said and I just didn't, you know, I wasn't spending a lot of time in it. While the statement wasn't false, I just, I don't think that that is exactly what this verse is, is referring to. I don't think this is referring to, uh, even though it's a great verse, right, that, that if you say, hey, of course, what's your soul worth? That's, that's all, you know, would be true and a valid point. But specifically here, what Jesus is talking about here has more to do with, with the end times and what's coming up. Because that's what he's leading into, and he's talking about this, the, the coming of the Son of, the Son of Man um, in his kingdom. And in verse number 24, he's referring to people here who are, you know, going to come up and take up his cross and deny himself. And, and this is not, you don't have to take up your cross and follow in the steps of Jesus to be saved. Right? And you look at all of the other verses surrounding this verse. You don't have to do all of these works and do all these things to receive salvation. So this, this, I don't think that this verse 26 is now all of a sudden just talking about salvation when all of the rest of the context is not. So when it says here, what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? This isn't referring to your eternal salvation of your soul, but think about it. What if you don't take up your cross and you don't live for God and you don't do the things that when you do live for God and you do live righteously, it's going to bring persecution. It's going to bring trials. Hey, you can go out and gain the whole world, right? But when it says lose your own soul, it's not referring to your soul going to hell. I think it's just talking about your soul dying. Many times in the scripture, you're going to see references to the soul as just to your life, right? So that soul shall surely be put to death. How many times have you seen that in the Old Testament, right? You go through the law, you go through the commandments, that soul shall be put to death. It doesn't mean that that soul's going to hell. It just means here's the commandment, here's the punishment, and they're going to die. So what he's saying here, and that's why he said in the previous verse, verse 25, for whosoever will save his life shall lose, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. He's not talking about your eternal life. He's literally talking about your physical life on this earth. He's saying, you're willing to give it up. Hey, God will spare you. And I think that there's going to be a lot of people who they're willing to do whatever for the Lord. They're willing to take up their cross and God will spare them and allow them to continue when things get real bad versus other people who want to go and they want to run and they want to hide. God can make it so that they just lose their life. And other than, in, in, in addition to that, you know, who, uh, but when the Bible says, what's a man private if he shall gain no world and lose his own soul? Like, what, who cares if you, if you end up accumulating a lot of wealth on this earth or whatever and you just end up dying anyways? Who cares? It's not, it it's, doesn't really matter. Um, but let's jump now to verse number 28 here. Or verse 27 says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. 
And we know that, uh, that when, after Jesus Christ comes back, there's going to be a judgment seat of Christ where believers are going to receive according to their works. And in all the preceding verses, he's talking about, hey, take up your cross and follow me. Do the works. Don't go after you know, the money or the riches and, and gain the whole world. Why don't you go after the true, uh, the true valuable things, the things of, of heaven, the heavenly things, not the carnal things? And then he brings up the fact that Jesus is going to come back with his angels and reward according to his works. And then he says in verse 28, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, when it's talking about the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, this is a prophetic statement. However, what he's saying, and, and see, some people will take a verse, a verse like this and try to use it and say, well, see, here's a prophecy that failed. Jesus Christ said that, you know, there are people there that were going to stay alive, right? Because what he said, they're not going to taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And Jesus Christ hasn't come back yet. Well, I'm going to show you, demonstrate why when he's referring to them seeing the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, He's not referring to, to himself literally coming back the second time. We're going to see other mentions and usages of these phrases of, you know, of the Son of Man coming in his kingdom and the kingdom of God being upon you and things like that to get a, a better biblical understanding of what he's referring to here. And um, when you start to see the various usages and references, I think it become more clear and it's not really a hang-up point. It shouldn't be a hang-up point. And in addition to everything else we're going to look at just with the usage of the, of the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, you can also look at, which is also addressed in, in chapter 17, the prophecies about Elijah coming first. You say, well, why, why, why does the, why the prophet say that Elijah must come first? Elijah, and he says, well, because he, he does have to come first. And actually, he has already come. And he's referring to John the Baptist. Okay, so... The prophecy wasn't literally talking about a literal physical incarnation of Elijah coming first, but rather a, more of a, a spiritual coming of, of Elijah through the John the Baptist, where John the Baptist had the same spirit as Elijah. Now, I'm not saying the same person or the same physical spirit, but you know, the same spirit of God upon him, and he acted and, and behaved himself in a way that was just like Elijah. So when he came on the scene... That was, hey, this is, this is like Elijah, right? And that was the fulfillment of that prophecy. And that's what Jesus Christ said. He said, this is the fulfillment. So in like manner, when he says, hey, no, you know, there's, there's people here that aren't even going to taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. He's not referring to the physical future second coming of him literally like, like that hasn't happened yet. These people not saying, but what they're going to see is what he's going to look like and, and Jesus Christ in his transfigured state at that time when he does come back. They're going to see Jesus in his glory because that's what happens immediately next in, verse, in, in chapter 17. Chapter 17 is what's known. They go to this Mount of Transfiguration where he brings up Peter, James, and John into the mountain with them to pray and he's literally transfigured before them temporarily. So he, he, they see him in his glorified body, in his glorified state prior to his death, burial, and resurrection. And they see Moses and Elijah, and we're going to get into all of that as well. But in every account of this story, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see the same exact event happening. And the, the, a similar phrase, uh, we'll, we'll look at all of those as well, about the, uh, the, that would match up with verse 28. Every single one is followed up immediately with the event of the transfiguration in the mount. Every single one. There is no, and I brought this up last week. When you start comparing Matthew and you start comparing the Gospels, you'll find that there's some slight variations of order. There's some things that happen in between because each account is giving, you know, they're, they're all truthful and correct, but some are giving more details and, 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 and relaying information that other people aren't. So when you start looking through and reading through, and, and, uh, and also, there's times in the story where it makes more sense to bring up events out of order. 
than in, than in exact chronological order every single time. When, when some events happen, oftentimes they'll recollect some other story that happened without giving the time frame reference of exactly when that happened. So while, yes, for the, for the vast majority of, of the passage, you're going to have chronological order. There are times where there's going to be stories inserted that, that make sense to put it there that didn't necessarily happen immediately within that exact time frame. So um, with all that being said, um, if you want to turn to these, you can. We're going to kind of, I'm going to kind of flip back and forth between Mark and Luke and, of course, and Matthew here. Definitely keep your place in, in Matthew. The other uh, parallel passages are found in Mark 9 and Luke 9. or Mark 10 and Luke 10, but we're going to be looking at both. Um, so I mentioned here in verse 28, till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. In Mark 9, verse number 1, the Bible reads, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste of death till they, see, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. So this is a slight variation. Of, of the same statement. Instead of seeing the Son of Man coming in His kingdom, He says, seeing the kingdom of God come with power. And then in Luke 9, verse 27, the Bible reads, But I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. So the reference here, and that's uh, consistent with all three of them, is the, the kingdom of God, you know, the coming of the kingdom of God. And what's really going to bring in the coming of the kingdom of God is when Jesus Christ returns. Because he's going to return to set up his kingdom here. And um, look at verse number... Actually, I'm going to read for you. You don't have to turn to these other places if you want. If, look at Luke 10. I'm going to read for you from Matthew 12, 28. Just other references to the kingdom of God. The Bible says in Matthew 12, 28, But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. So it, it, we're going to see multiple references to the usage of the kingdom of God, some of them being more present, like right now, and others being coming in the future. Uh, Mark 10, 15 says, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. So, the king, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is to show you there's a broad meaning for the kingdom of God that's not necessarily just pinpointed to one specific event of like, you know, Jesus' return that's going to happen in the future. And, it, you know, when Jesus says, you know, um, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. This isn't referring to necessarily specifically Jesus Christ coming back as a second coming. Right? It's, a, it's a broader usage of the phrase, you know, receiving the kingdom of God. Luke chapter 10, look at verse number 9. The Bible says, And heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. But into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same, and say, Even the very dust of your city which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. So both times he's saying, the kingdom of God is coming really close unto you. The kingdom of God is, is close. And then in Luke 21, verse 31, the Bible says, So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Now in Luke 21, in this context, is referring to the end times event, okay? And, and so, again, the reason why I wanted to show you these various usages is to first just demonstrate that it is broader and can be used broadly. Jesus used this term broadly, where it's obviously not just all referring to one specific event. And when, you know, and all of that said to not have to have all of this doubt, because some people will tell you that Either they're preterist and they'll say that this stuff all already happened, like the, the second coming of Jesus, you know, whatever, all these different prophetic events has already happened. It's already over because of statements like this. We say, well, I mean, they're going to see the Son of Man coming. So he must, the kingdom must already have been set up on earth. And it hasn't happened yet. 
where it's just literally a misunderstanding of what Jesus is saying when he said that. It's really just what they were going to see was a glimpse of what's going to happen when he sets up his kingdom here on earth. And, and, and we'll see that very clearly as we continue on in Matthew 17. But in Luke 21, if you're not there already, turn to Luke 21. We'll look at verse number 25. This is a parallel passage with Matthew 24. The Bible says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. This is the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is what it's talking about. It's talking about going through these tribulations. Men's hearts are filling them for fear. And then he says, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. These are the people who aren't going to save their life and end up losing it. These are the people willing to lose their life. They're willing to bear the cross of Jesus Christ and they'll endure unto the end, right? The end meaning when Jesus Christ comes back not, uh, not receiving their own um, personal eternal life. So when it says here, then shall you see the Son of Man come in cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, look up, lift up your heads, for redemption draweth nigh. Verse 29, and he spake to them a parable. Behold, the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. And then, of course, I, I already read verse 31. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Again, another one of those statements that's, that's often misinterpreted about this generation not passing away till all be fulfilled. It's the generation that exists when these things are happening is not going to die off until everything is fulfilled. This isn't the current generation of when Jesus is speaking to his disciples at that time. It's the generation that is, that is in that time frame that, that all of these events that he's referring to are not going to span a really large time frame, that they're all going to happen uh, within, within a relatively short period of time, uh, at least within, within a generation, right? So when we start in Matthew 17, we're seeing a little glimpse of the second coming of Christ. Jesus is transfigured into his heavenly body before them as he will appear when he comes back the second time. Look at verse number one here in Matthew 17. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. So all of a sudden, he's, he's normal Jesus, you know, dressed in his normal attire, looking normal. They go up into the mountain. He goes up into a high mountain. He just brings a few disciples with him. And then all of a sudden, it's like, man, they say his, his face just shone like the sun. I mean, it was just this, this great, glorious um, appearance of Jesus Christ is uh, where, where he's wearing this white clothes and everything. He's just like glowing. And it says, behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. So not only are they seeing Jesus here, but they're also seeing Moses and Elijah who are literally, and this is the narrator of the scripture, the Holy Ghost speaking. This isn't an account, just an account from someone else. This is the narrator uh, uh, telling us that it was Moses and Elijah, that they were there speaking with Jesus. And it says, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. So Jesus just tells them right there, you, you know, they just had this vision. 
They see this vision of what's basically going to happen or what Jesus is going to look like in the future, and he's revealing more unto them. He's revealing himself unto them, revealing his transfigured state unto them, and that's why he made the statement that there's going to be some people here that shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Because those disciples, they all ended up dying without Jesus literally making his second coming. And in every single instance of the account of this, this is what happens. It's, it's not a stretch. I think it's really easy to receive and understand that here. Now, what's cool about this, we see some other hints that tie together with this story. Even though this is a real short story, there's not a whole lot that happens there. They go up in the mountain. Jesus is transfigured. He's talking to Moses and Elijah. Okay, and, that, and that's the, basically the information that we get from this. Flip over to Acts chapter 1. I'm going to tie in a couple of things here. Just some, just some real small nuggets of information. We're not going to spend tons of time going into Bible prophecy and into the second coming of Jesus Christ, but I want to show you a couple of things I think are really neat in Scripture that, that tie together. And in Acts chapter 1, we're going to start reading in verse number 9. The Bible says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why st stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem, from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. So, not, again, not a whole lot of information given here, but basically when Jesus Christ appears to him, then he leaves, he departs. His disciples are just looking up and they're watching him just, just go back up into heaven. And then the angels are standing there and go like, well, why are you guys just standing around gazing up in the sky all day, right? The, and he says, uh, the same Jesus... He's going to come again in like manner, meaning the same way that you see him going away is the same way he's going to come back and return to earth the second time. And what's interesting about that is the place where they are is called, it was the Mount of Olives. It was Mount Olivet. And I believe when Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to come back to the Mount of Olives at his, at, at his second coming and literally land there and potentially the place they were at. Now, it just said they went into a high mountain in Matthew 17 when they went and saw Jesus transfigured. It's possible, and, and unless there's some other place that I've missed in, in my study of Scripture, that they could possibly be at Mount Olivet here, but it doesn't tell us that specifically. I looked at all the accounts trying to see if, it, if there is like an actual way to know. I, I didn't see it. But if you, know, if you know one way or the other and say, no, Pastor Burson's, this can't be, you know, I'd be interested in seeing that why, or that it definitely is, that would be interesting too. But I think when he comes back, because he said the same way you see him go, he's going to come back. Now, again, this isn't like, I'm not super dogmatic about this. This isn't, this isn't some uh, doctrine that's just like, man, if you don't believe this, then, then you don't know what you're talking about. These are just little bits of information I think are pretty interesting. And this is, this is kind of where, where I come out on, on believing on this stuff. Turn if you would to Revelation chapter 11, because the other, the other bit of information we got from Matthew 17 was that Moses and Elijah are with Jesus Christ with this reference of seeing the coming of the Son of Man, Right? with this vision of what's to come in the future. Because I don't think that that vision of just seeing him in his, I don't think it's just about his transfigured state. I think we get more information about the coming of the Son of Man from, from than just the transfiguration. I think it is important that Moses and Elijah were there with him and were speaking with him, that that is a, a, an integral part of the story as well when it comes to end times events and what's going to happen in the future. Revelation chapter 11, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. There's going to be two witnesses on the earth at the time when God's pouring out his wrath on the earth. And I believe that these two witnesses are going to be Moses and Elijah. 
And as we get in this, we'll see a little bit more why. One is because of what we see in Matthew 17. We see Jesus Christ coming back in, 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 in his glory. We get, because he's transfigured. Moses and Elijah are sitting there talking with him. But then as we read Revelation chapter 11, look at verse number 4. The Bible says, These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. So one of the powers that these, that these witnesses are going to have is to make it so that it doesn't rain. Now, there is specifically a prophet of the Old Testament that did this very thing. That's Elijah. We can see that in the book of James. You could also see that when it says the Bible says that you know, Elijah prayed that it would not rain. It didn't rain for the span of three and a half years. And he prayed again, and then it rained. Right? That was Elijah. And then it says, and in the Revelation eleven six, 6, these have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Who turned water into blood? Moses. That was Moses. Now, obviously, it is the power of God. I mean, it's not that Elijah had his own special superhero powers to do this and Moses of his own power was able to do these things. It's all done through the power of the Holy Ghost. However, the information that's being revealed unto us by God, I think is going to direct us in this. It, it's, it's, it's a very reasonable conclusion to come to to say, well, Jesus is speaking with Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah specifically were used in the, with those particular miracles. And now they're being referenced again in Revelation chapter 11. I think if we connect the dots, it's pretty easy to see that these people are going to be the ones that are the witnesses during this time when God's pouring out his wrath on the earth. And it's pretty cool. When you start piecing all the pieces together, the puzzle, it's pretty interesting. So that's, I just wanted to bring that up. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 17. Like I said, it's easy to get to really just get into that stuff. You know, prophecy is really, really exciting and interesting and, and it's, you know, fun to study. But I don't want to spend the whole time on that tonight because we got, we got a lot of information in Matthew 17 that we need to get to. So let's keep reading here. Look at verse number 10. And this is where the disciples ask them then about, about Elias, about Elijah and John the Baptist, right? And the disciples asked him saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias has come already. And they knew him not but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. So, you know, I've already, I already mentioned this, but I don't, I don't let these, some of these smaller phrases bother me that much because of the usage that Jesus Christ has and that prophecy uses when it talks about people here. And it doesn't even matter, you know, I, I brought this up in previous sermons, I don't remember how long it's been, but the fact that John the Baptist didn't even know that he was Elijah, because they were asking him, well, who art thou? Are, are, art thou the Christ? And he said, no, I'm not the Christ. Are, art thou Elias? Art thou that prophet? And he said, no. He said, I'm not Elijah. I'm the, you know, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. But Jesus said, well, yeah, that is, this is the coming of Elijah. This is that prophecy being fulfilled. So, just because he didn't even realize it doesn't mean it wasn't so. And I've made this point before, and I think it's a, it's a very valid point to make. When people try to criticize us for being King James only, they'll say, well, don't you know that the translators didn't even think that the work that they produced was inerrant and perfect and, and just the word of God that's been preserved through gener... You know, it doesn't matter if they believe that or not. What matters is the finished work. What matters is, can we look at this and see that it is inerrant, that it is without, without fail the Word of God? That's what really matters. What matters is, is did God make the, the promise to preserve His Word for all generations or not? He did. And it already existed in their time in another language. They brought it over into English. And it's been proven. It's been tried, it's been tested, and has been found uh, completely satisfactory. So, 
just because they say, oh no, you know, we could still improve and there's still change, you know, that doesn't mean that it wasn't uh, preserved perfectly. Anyways, uh, let's keep reading here. I want to I want to get into a few other things. Verse number 14 in Matthew 17, the Bible says, And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. This, is, this gives us some more insight into what happens when people are possessed with devils. We see this. This is a great example of it, but it happens in other places too. And oftentimes when a person is possessed with a devil, they try to hurt themselves. They try to kill themselves. And if you think that demon possession or devil possession has gone away just because it's the year 2019, you're sorely mistaken. I mean, where, where have all the devils gone? They obviously existed during the time of Jesus Christ. There's no denying that at all, unless you just choose to not believe the Bible for what it actually says. And, you know, there may be some people that will say, oh, yeah, when it started, they just didn't know any better. They just didn't know science. They didn't understand that there's chemical reactions in the brain and that this is all just diagnosed through psychology and that this can all be, you know, excused away and, and, and told that this other thing. Look, this is the word of God, not the, the, the foolish wisdom of this world. And when the Bible's saying that these people are, are possessed with devils, I believe that. I believe that 100%, and I believe that still happens today. And I believe people are getting diagnosed. And I think one of the, one of the effects, I'm not saying that everyone who tries to kill themselves is possessed with a devil, but I am saying that people who are possessed with devils have a higher propensity of hurting themselves and trying to kill themselves because we see that pattern over and over and over again in the scripture. And when you see people who are all into death and love death and are into cutting themselves or in all these things, you know what? That lines up perfectly with people who are possessed with devils. It does. And they have all these problems and depression and all these other things. And, and yeah, you know what? They're going to feel kind of nuts. Why? Because they've got another evil spirit living inside of them. Yeah, that's going to cause some problems in your life. And it's going to manifest itself outwardly in many ways. And it's, it's not just some psychological problem or, or a, a medication problem. It's a spiritual problem. And it needs to be dealt with spiritually. So we have this lunatic. And of course, luna comes from you know, the word for the moon. And, and um, I don't want to get into all that, but this person is, uh, he's crazy, right? I mean, that's what, what a lunatic is, but he's, he's uh, oftentimes falling in the fire, often in the water. So this is this guy's son, and he's asking for mercy. And he brings him to disciples, and he says, you know what? Your disciples couldn't cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And I think Jesus' response is twofold here. He says, faithless and perverse generation. One, because you've got people that are, that are in this state. I mean, it's a perverted generation when you've got people just, um, you know, I don't, I don't believe personally that just, it's just completely random who gets possessed with devils. I think people have, have more of a tendency to allow devils in than others. I don't think it's just completely 100% random. You'll notice, again, the, the people who, who end up becoming possessed with devils are going to have problems with drinking and drugs and into witchcraft and sorcery and all kinds of other things. They're going to open up that door to allow these, these devils to come in. So when he says, oh, faithless and perverse generation, yeah, because you're opening up the doors for these things to even happen. But also when we see, you know, faithless, the reason why, you know, the disciples asked him in just a few verses why they couldn't cast him out because he's, you know, this guy's possessed with devils. And the disciples couldn't do anything about it after Jesus already gave them power over devils to go and cast them out, right? And it says here in verse 18, Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. So Jesus is able to cast this devil out. Obviously, Jesus has power over, over everything and over all the devils and everything. But 
the disciples asked him in verse 19, Then came the disciples to Jesus' part and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. So whatever was happening in this situation, obviously this was a pretty... Um, violent type of a devil that was inside of this kid, this child. He's, I mean, he's throwing him in the fire, into the water. And I, I would guess, I would venture to say that the disciples were probably a little fearful of this devil. And maybe because of the power it had or possessed over this person that they started to become fear, you know, unbelieving. Because Jesus said it was because of their unbelief that they were even would have the power over this devil because it was, it was so powerful that they seem to have a problem with that. But Jesus makes this great statement in telling them about the, the un, you know, well, it's because of your unbelief. He says, I tell you, you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, this is just, just a really small, small seed. You just, have, you just have this much faith. You shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. What a great promise from Jesus saying, you know, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much faith, but you have to have faith. But it doesn't really take that much. And faith is you're honestly believing. You're not, you're not doubting. You're not wavering. I mean, you, you believe it, right? Like this is going to happen. You have that faith and you're relying on Christ, on the power of God, on the power of Christ. Completely rely on him. He says, you can make this mountain move. Now, we don't want to go to a, a verse like this and be like, all right, I'm going to test this and see if I can move this mountain from here to here. Right? And, and, and treat this like it's a Jedi power of the force that you can wield and I'm going to move a mountain over here and over here. You're completely missing the point. Completely missing the point. The whole, there's no purpose to remove a mountain from one place to another. There's no reason why God would even want for that to happen. But the, the whole purpose, the illustration he's giving, it's the reason why he's telling him this, is because moving a mountain is a completely impossible task. Right. Completely impossible. I mean, it, there, there is no way that anyone even think like, oh yeah, I think I want to move that mountain over there. I want to take Stone Mountain. I don't like where Stone Mountain is right now. I think we should just pick it up and let's just move it up a little bit further north or move it a little bit further south and just kind of get it out of the way. It's really causing a problem in that area. It's a nice area. We want to build that up some more. We got this big mountain in the way. You, you, can't, you, you can't do that. It's too monumental of a task to move a mountain. But the whole point is Jesus is saying nothing is impossible with your faith in God. That's, that's the whole purpose of it is to tell you, you know, when you have faith, nothing's impossible. Oh, you're facing this big spiritual battle and this big spiritual problem and there's this devil that, that is just seems really powerful and, that, and who are you? You're just some person. Well, if you have the, just a little bit of faith in Christ, that just a faith is a grain of mustard seed, nothing's impossible for you. Nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is impossible, you know, under, you know, with the power of God. Is what he's saying. Even, even just being able to remove a mountain, he's saying that, that's nothing. Because God can do anything. We look at something like that and go, that, there's no way. You just throw up your hands and give up. And, and Jesus is saying, no, just, just have the faith. And, and, you could, and God will make the impossible possible. And then in verse 21, though, he, he gives them a little bit more, besides kind of rebuking them a little bit for, for their unbelief, Right? Which, this also lets us into the mind of God a little bit. And I brought this up when we went over Peter stepping out of the boat, right? And walking on the water to Jesus as Jesus is walking on the water. And he starts going and then there's the, you know, the wind is boisterous and he sees the waves and stuff and he, and he starts to doubt and he starts to sink, Right? And he said, Lord, save me, right? And then Jesus immediately reached out his hand and he saved him. And he says, O ye of little faith, wherefore did you doubt? Right? And, and, and he's telling him, like, why, why did you even doubt? But if you put yourself in his shoes, like, for us, it's kind of like, I can see why he doubted. But on Jesus' perspective, he's saying, there's absolutely no reason to doubt at all. And he's basically saying the same thing here. Look, there is no reason for you guys to doubt at all 
that the devil could be passed out by, by any of these other things. You just need to have the faith. Just believe it. And, 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 and nothing is impossible for you. But he gives a little bit more clarification here on verse 21. On the things that are more difficult, he says, Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And, and again, I don't want to go too deep into this because we're just covering the chapter as a whole. But when you look into fasting, fasting is always tied in with prayer. And when people fast, it's, it's always because there's some very serious thing, event going on. Some serious need where they just like really want to get a hold of God and, and they're just fervently praying for help in a particular area. And through that, that fasting and through that prayer, I think keeps you more focused and probably helps your own faith in, in just relying on God and just being singularly focused on that, which will help you when you want to, to face these big challenges, like in this case, you know, this really powerful devil or whatever, you know, whatever that spiritual battle is. He's saying the prayer and the fasting. Now, if Jesus said this kind goeth not out by prayer and fasting and Jesus cast them out, that also tells me that Jesus, we know he was doing a lot of prayer and we see that. I mean, we see him at these, anytime he's not teaching and preaching and healing, he's going off by himself to pray and in addition to that, I mean, we know that, that he's also not really eating. He's got to be fasting a lot when he's, when he's going through because he's out in the wilderness and he's going off by himself to pray. And, you know, the disciples even say it in, in another passage, like, well, you know, uh, where he said, I, I have meat to eat that you know not of. He wasn't referring to physical food because he hadn't eaten yet. But he was, um, he was referring to that spiritual meaning. He was referring to, to manna. But uh, let's, keep, let's keep reading. Look at verse number 22. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men. And they shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. Now the last chapter Jesus, we, we read, Jesus started to reveal his death, burial, and resurrection unto the disciples. We saw earlier in this chapter that when he, when he told his disciples not to, um, not to speak of what they saw, he said, Jesus charged them, saying, Television to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. In another account, either in Luke or in Mark, I forget which one, um, the Bible tells us that they didn't know what he was talking about with the resurrection of the dead. They still didn't understand. And, and they don't understand it until it actually happens. Like Jesus keeps warning them about it and telling them about it and telling them pretty plainly. Right? We saw last week that he's saying, you know, the Son of Man must go and suffer many things of the chief priests and the elders and, and be, uh, be put to death and, and, and all this stuff. And he's explaining it to them. And Peter said, no, it's not going to happen, right? And then here he tells them and they're exceeding sorry, they're sad. But the reason why I'm making a point, and we're going to see Jesus continue to, re continue to reveal this unto him and explain to him. And the purpose for Jesus doing this, I believe, is that he wants them to be prepared. He wants them to be ready. He wants this to sink in. This is extremely important. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, obviously. Right? This is the gospel. And he needs them to just completely understand this and, and make sure they are not going to walk away from this event without knowing that Jesus has been telling them and telling them and telling them about it. But in addition to that, he tries to prepare them for it, not just not to forget about it after it happens, but to prepare them for it because it's going to be a serious event. That's a significant event in their life. It's, it's, a, it's a big deal. They all end up leaving and forsaking him, even though he's warned them about it. But the point of warning them is so that they wouldn't leave him, so that they wouldn't forsake him. Right? And we have a lot of messages in Scripture. We have a lot of information given to us, and it's given to us over and over again. And you'll notice me, oftentimes, throughout the year, I'll be hammering home on some of the same subjects over and over and over again. And I really hope that when that happens, you don't sit there and think, oh, man, Basil Burns is talking about this again, and start getting just kind of an attitude of like, oh, I don't need to hear this, and, and start... You know, thinking that you're just so far beyond the warnings because they're here for a reason. 
And I'm going to keep bringing up a lot of the same things over and over again. As much as I see them repeated in Scripture, I'm trying to do my best to do the same thing because we need to not forget about these warnings. Because while right now you may be strong and secure, right now in this story, his disciples seem strong and secure, there's going to come a time where it's not going to be so strong, where they're going to be faced with more opposition, where they're going to be facing things like the, the soldiers coming out with their swords drawn and, and arresting Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and these times will come up at some point in your life that's not going to be known unto you. By and large, you won't know when these events are going to happen. So you need to be ready. We need to be treating these truths and, and, and taking them in and, and not just, you know, thinking that, I, that we're so far above and beyond these things. Over and over and over again, there is warning after warning after warning. The Apostle Paul said, I cease not day and night to warn you with tears. For me to write the same things again unto you, for me is not grievous, but for you it is necessary. We see these things regularly in Scripture. Even Jesus Christ is going to be telling them the same things. Why? For their benefit. Why? Because we as people, we as human beings, can be pretty stupid. <laughs> because you think that one time should be enough, right? Hey, I told you once. Well, we're not, that, we're not that bright. We need to be hit over the head sometimes. And even then, we still end up making bad, you know, getting into sin and doing stupid things, even when you know things are wrong. But it's safe to hear it over and over and over again and to just hammer it home and make sure. And, you know, this is one of the things, when you have kids, if you have kids, make sure you're hammering home the really important things in life. I mean the really important things. I, I really try to bring myself and to reset and to refocus on this with my kids. What's going to matter more in their life is not how much calculus they learn, but how many basic morality principles and teaching and instruction that they're going to learn where you can be the smartest person in the world. And I'm not against being educated. You guys know this. I, I preach on this. You know, I think that we should have a good education. But what's so much more important than that is how you live your life and how you deal with people and how you worship the Lord and how you obey Him because that is going to determine you know, so much more in the course of your life than just, you know, on the one hand, you could teach your kids to earn a lot of money and to be real smart to do things that way. I would much rather my children not earn very much money at all, but be very wise in the ways of the Lord and be very wise in, 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 in making decisions that will impact their lives so that they're not getting divorced, so that they're not having kids out of wedlocks, so they're not getting involved in drinking and drugs, and all of these things are going to ruin their life. So we need to make sure that we put the priority on the right things and don't leave them unsaid and undone. Teach them to them and don't just say, well, I, I brought that up once. I told them that drinking was bad one time. I told them one time that they need to wait for marriage if they're gonna if they're gonna be with a with a man or with a woman. That's not enough. They need to be told regularly. We need to hear it regularly. Let's get back here to Matthew chapter 17. Look at verse number um, 24. We're going to close out this, this passage here, verse 24. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received the tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? So here we've got, you know, tribute is a tax. So the guy that, that's the tax collector comes up to Peter. He's saying, Hey, doesn't your master pay taxes? Huh? Doesn't he pay tribute? And Peter's like, Yeah. He didn't know what to say. I mean, look, everybody gets afraid of, of the, the tax man, right? The guy that, that under the, the, the power and authority of the government that's going to bring in their arms to you pay or, or else, right? No one wants to have the, the microscope and the magnifying glass of the IRS on them, right? Nobody wants that. I don't care who you are. Just like nobody wants a cop just driving behind them. You don't have to be doing anything wrong. Nobody is comfortable when you've got cops just driving around. You're like, man, I don't, like, 
Like, I, he's going to get me for something. I know he is because we're not perfect. It just makes you uncomfortable and tense. And then they're like, well, how come you're sweating? Huh? You seem a little nervous. Because you're a cop. That doesn't mean I didn't do anything. But it's, come on, I'm, I'm a normal person. Everybody gets, gets a little nervous around people like you. So, G, so Peter's in the same situation. They're like, hey, doesn't he pay taxes? Because he knows there's consequences for not paying taxes, right? So he's going to say, oh, well, yeah. Yeah, he does. And let's keep reading here. Verse number 25. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him. So before Peter could even say anything, now, before Peter could say anything, Jesus is just saying, hey, what thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? He said, how does this work, Peter? You know, do they, do they tax the foreigners? Do they tax the strangers? Or do they tax their own children? He says, Peter saith unto them of strangers. Jesus saith unto them, then are the children free. So he corrects them in the sense that he says, we don't have to pay these taxes. We don't have to pay tribute. The children are free. They need to tax the strangers. That's fine. But the children are free. But he doesn't stop there. Right? So, so this is just what's right. Is Jesus, like, does Jesus have to pay taxes here? Is he, like, is he, would he be obligated to? No. He's teaching Peter that, no, we don't have to. And I believe the same thing. You know, we don't have to pay these, you know, we definitely shouldn't be forced to, but it's not right that we have to pay these taxes on our property, like, just because you own, oh, oh you, you got to pay your rent. You got to pay your taxes. You, you own a vehicle, you got to pay taxes. You own this, you got to pay taxes. You, you, know, you go to work, you got to pay taxes. You, look, they don't have the right to do all that. I don't care what their, what their piece of paper says. They don't have the right to tax us all this stuff. But look what Peter does. Even though it's not right, he still ends up paying it. I'm the first one that's going to say amen and amen against the taxes. <laughs> All right? But I don't, I don't believe in just not paying what the tax man is saying that, that you have to pay. I will file and pay these taxes because that's not what this life is all about. And I don't want that to become my fight and my struggle all about this, this money and, and these wicked people who want to just take your money and whatever. Look, that's, I'm not going to spend my, all of my time and energy fighting that battle. Because there's a spiritual battle to be fought. And at the end of the day, I'm just going to rely on God to help me in that area. If, you know, I mean, taxes are, are high. They're high everywhere. I mean, someone's going to come up with something. Oh, well, they're not high here. Okay, fine. But there's going to be a lot of other problems then if you, live, if you live in those countries where they're not as high. Whatever. Here's what Jesus did. Verse 27. He says, notwithstanding. So notwithstanding the fact that we're free. Notwithstanding, we don't have to pay this. Lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast an hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. Take that and give unto them for me and thee. So he's saying, look, we don't need to offend them. We, don't, we shouldn't have to pay this, but go ahead. Here's what you do. I'm going to provide this for you. And, and actually, just, he's, this really cool miracle where he's just like, go, just go cast a hook into the sea. And the first one you catch up, you know what? He's going to have money in his mouth. Now, how often does that happen? I never hear, I've never heard, I've never heard of that other than this story. Now, maybe it's happened, I don't know, but I've never heard of this, this actually happening. So it's a really cool story. But besides being really cool and obviously a miracle, I think that there's a little bit more that we could learn from this. And I think this is really interesting. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And specifically that this is happening with Peter. With this story with Peter, Jesus specifically told Peter, because Peter was a fisherman. When, when Peter was called to be an apostle, 
Peter was on his boat fishing, just so were James and John. They were all fishermen. That was, that was their trade. You know, we had Levi, we had other people that, that actually, we had a tax collector in the group, right? There's a man that, that collected tribute. There were other people that did different things that Jesus called to be apostles after him. But Peter was a fisherman, and Jesus told Peter, when he called him, he says, from henceforth thou shalt not catch fish, thou shalt catch men. So he was instructed that, you're no longer going to be a fisherman for fish. I'm going to, I'm going to show you how to fish for men and to, and to bring men in, right? Because ultimately that's what soul winning is. That's what preaching the gospel is. We're trying to go fishing for men and to bring them to Christ, right? We're going out there. We're bringing the word. We're bringing the gospel. We're bringing the good news and trying to catch them for Christ, if you will. And one of the things that I think that this verse is teaching, this example of Jesus telling him to go catch a fish and there's going to be money in the fish's mouth that's going to pay your way and it's going to pay for your taxes or whatever, is the fact that those who, live of the go or those who preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And that the fish is symbolic of the believer, of the person who's coming in, that's going to supply your carnal needs as you're doing spiritual work. And that's what this is demonstrating here. And this is backed up by actually, you know, we looked at a lot of, of symbolic things in this chapter tonight, and especially talking about end times. And I gave you some things that I believe that, yeah, there's a lot of little things there, but, but I wouldn't still call them just concrete, right? Where we just have absolute... This is perfectly clear. There is no doubt about this because there's clear scripture. But in this story, while this particular story is just an illustration, we do have concrete scripture regarding what I'm teaching that I believe that this, this is representative of. And it's found in 1 Corinthians 9 as well as in other places. Look at verse number 6 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The Bible reads, Or I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? Forbearing working means not working. Paul was working with his hands. He built tents. He was a tent maker. Paul and Barnabas, when they went out on their mission trip, though, oftentimes they would work. Now, not all the time, but oftentimes they were. And when they're in, uh, when they're writing to Corinth, he's saying, look, we have the power. Don't we have the power to stop working? Because they did, because they could be supported financially through the people who they're benefiting. He's saying, and he's saying, don't we have the power to do that? Who goeth a warfare at any time, any time at his own charges, meaning at his own expense? When you're going to war, you don't pay your own way to go to war. I mean, you've got a military in a country that's going to outfit you and supply you and say, okay, okay, soldier, here's your gun, here's your rations, here's your supplies, go off and fight. You're not bringing all of your own gear and all of your own food and all of your own stuff to go fight in someone else's war. They outfit you. They supply you. Well, we're in a spiritual battle. And there's a, there's a spiritual war going on and the soldiers are going to step up and do the work and go out there and be on the front lines and fight. They need to be taken care of too because you're focused on the fight. And look, would you want to have a soldier that's out fighting in a war to defend you and to defend your land and defend your... Do you want them worried about like, oh man, well, where am I going to get this from? No, let's just supply it to them and get them out there so that they could keep fighting and they don't have to worry about, you know, where's their next meal going to come from? Let's do our, our best to supply that for them. It's the same concept with the spiritual fight, that there needs to be people out there fighting the spiritual fights and in the front lines and in these positions to be able to take the battle out there and, and really just full time be focused on that fight, on these battles. And they need to be provided for also. Let's keep reading here in verse 7. Who goeth to warfare any time his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? We're talking about plowing, right? Because we see a lot of, again, sowing references of people going out and plowing and planting and sowing. Well, there's also reaping. And he's saying, who, who goes out and plants a vineyard for himself, but then you don't even eat anything of it? Of course you're going to partake of that. Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? He's saying, you think I'm just making this stuff up as just, just in my mind as a man? He says, no, the law says the same exact thing. God's law. 
Verse number 9, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. So you're saying, even in God's law, it's, it's written that when you, you're using an ox, right, to, to stamp on the corn and make your corn meal and your corn power and all this other stuff, it's doing work, it's doing labor, you don't muzzle it, you let the cow eat a little bit of the food that it's doing because it's doing the hard work. But then he goes on to explain, he says, does God take care for oxen? He said, do you think God really just cares that much about the oxen that, he's, that that's the reason why it's in the law? No, he's teaching a greater principle and a greater truth. That those who are doing the work should be provided for them and not be muzzled and say, no, if you're going to do that work, you also, because there's people out there, I'll tell you, there's a people out there in the house church movement and other places that'll tell you, no, it's not right for pastors to get paid. You know, they need to be keeping a second job and doing all this other work. And look at the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is the one who said, hey, don't I have power to not work? Now, he did work in, in, in specific instances for sure because he's trying to show an example in a few cases to people who were lazy and people who weren't doing the work. And he's saying, look, this is how you do the work. And you roll up your sleeves. He said, I can work at night and do this work by day. And this is how you ought to be working. You need to work hard. Don't be lazy. Take care. Provide for your family. Don't be busybodies. Don't be gossips. Do the work. And don't say, oh, well, I'm too busy with this. I can't go and serve the Lord. You can. You can do both, actually. But it's better if you can have a soldier, if you could have a person dedicated to this work alone and not being double-minded in the sense of, well, I still need to, to provide. I still need to do all these other things. It's better to be singly focused. So he says, Doth God take care for ox in verse 10? Or saith he it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt. There's not, there's not, and this isn't just his opinion. He said there's no doubt about this. It's not because God cares about the ox at all. There is no, there's zero doubt. For our sakes, no doubt that this is written. That he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? He said, we're going out, I mean, we're preaching the word of God to you, all this spiritual truth and goodness. We're putting forth this work to teach you this stuff, to show you the right way, to teach you the word of God, to get people saved. We're doing this work. Is it really that big of a deal that you could, you could help feed me? So I can keep doing this work? I mean, is, it that, is, is he saying, oh, it's a big, you know, you need to give me a mansion and you need to give me all these vehicles and all this, this lavish lifestyle? That's not what he's saying. He's just talking about his needs being met. That's it. And, and it makes perfect sense. And we see that in Scripture, you know, over and over again. Let the, let, the, let the elders that rule well be, be, be kind of worthy of double honor. They, that, 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 that work and labor in the word and in their doctrine, and you know, let them be worthy of double honor. Look at verse number 12. It says, If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. He's saying, basically saying, we have this power, but we haven't used it. We have the power to forbear working. We have the power to receive money of you to, to do all this, he says, but we haven't used that. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? He's saying, don't you even know? I mean, in the way that God set things up in the Old Testament, the priests, the Levites, they lived of the things of the temple. God provided for them all. By the, they worked full time doing the service of the Lord, and they were provided for 100% with all of their needs through the sacrifices, through, the, through every, you know, all, all the things that were given of the temple. And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so, in the same manner, you say, yeah, but that was Old Testament. Even so, hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. It's that simple. It's real easy to show this in Scripture. And I think it's actually a wicked thing to say, oh no, the, you know, Pastors and preachers, they shouldn't, they shouldn't be paid at all. They shouldn't be taken care of. They need to work a second job in order to, to provide for themselves. 
we do not see that in Scripture. We see the exact opposite, and we see an exception to the rule with the Apostle Paul by not receiving in some case. And look, you can see another place where he says, hey, the people of Macedonia, they helped supply my need. They, they supplied your lack. And those are situations where he was receiving from people to do his work. So it's not even that he was doing this all the time. He wasn't constantly self-employed in addition to doing his work. There were just certain times throughout his life and throughout his missionary work where he was. And he was generally proving a point for that. But um, So you can see how that, that last story there with the fish, you know, we don't base all of our doctrine on, on some parable or some story like that, but it's very clear where the, the fundamental doctrine comes from that is indisputable. That is, without a doubt, yes, this is okay for the person who's serving and, living, you know, and preaching the gospel to live of the gospel. And I think that that story just illustrates that one, one more time of the fish providing the need for the soul winners for the evangelist, for the, the Bible teachers. Let's bow our heads that word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the great things that we can learn from your word. I pray that you would please open up your words to us, continue to, to teach us good doctrine, and Lord, help us um, throughout the week, help us to make good choices, help us to not be um, forgetful hearers, but doers of the work, Lord. And we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. 